Well, in this particular section of our teaching, we decided to have a conversation, mm -hmm. um, Matthew and I, about 1 Corinthians 13. I know that we're teaching the rest of this book expositorily, but I just felt like it would be important for us to discuss the purpose of chapter 13. Now, there's only 13 verses in chapter 13, so it is a smaller chapter. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a better way of handling that. So I'm going to start off and then we're going to kind of, you know, both weigh in on what we think is going on here in this passage. Absolutely. Well, first of all, you have to remember that we've just finished chapter 12. Mm. Now in chapter 12, you're getting the um, instructions for how to use the gifts of the Spirit. And then when you get into chapter 14, you're getting the instructions for how the spiritual gifts should be used in the church. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this 13 is in between all that. So it's still part of the same spiritual gifts teaching. So some people pull this out and kind of make it a love chapter. Yeah. And, and, you know, because it does explain what love looks like, but really it's still talking about the, using, the, the usage of the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So keeping that in mind, um, I was reading through this one time and the Holy Spirit told me, to listen for the cry. And I didn't know what he meant. And I said, what do you mean the cry? And uh, he said, listen for Paul's cry. And all of a sudden I saw the old prophet writing this in tears. In, in, in my spirit, obviously I didn't have a vision. I just, I just felt his, his, his anguish as he was writing this in tears. And I realized that I was not reading the love chapter. I was reading the absence of love chapter. Mm. Wow. I was reading what spiritual gifts look like without love. And so I think the way that Paul could explain this best to us is that he pretty much lived a loveless life. He was not married. Mm -hmm. He did not have children. His friends had forsaken him. He spent most of his ministry in prison. I mean, he had been beaten five times with the cat yeah. of nine tails, stoned outside Lystra. I mean, this... I think that maybe his thorn in the flesh could have been that everywhere he went, he got beat up. And so the Apostle Paul is basically saying, let, let me read to some of this, and I want you to listen for the cry this time as I read this. And again, we're using the, um, uh, the N NRSV version for this, for this whole teaching. Uh, if I have prophetic powers, well, let me just start in verse 1. <laughs> if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but I do not have love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. So he's saying, you know, if, if I, even though I have a lot to say, if I don't have love in my life, I feel like I'm just making noise. And then he says, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, which he did, if I have all faith to move mountains, but I have not any love, he says, I'm, I feel like nothing. Mm -hmm. He said, I've got the faith to move mountains. If I give away all my possessions and hand my, hand my body over, hand over my body to be burned is what one version says, one translation says. If I give my body over to be burned so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So in this first part, I want you to hear what he's saying. Is he's saying, I go to these worship services and I have all these spiritual gifts working through me and people mm -hmm. really think I'm something. Then the lights go out. Mm -hmm. Then I go home alone. And then I, have, I feel like nothing. So I feel like even though I have all these spiritual gifts, unless I have love in my life, I'm empty. I don't have anything to replenish me. Okay, so that's the first part of it. The first part of it is he is explaining a personal experience, mm -hmm. but now he's using it, his life, as the illustration to say, if you try to use a spiritual gift without the temperament of love. So love becomes the temperament for all spiritual gifts yeah, to work through. Absolutely. And, and you know, Matthew, I know you've probably seen this before. Have you ever seen anyone try to use the gift of prophecy without love? Certainly. Oh, it's, of course. It's mean. Yeah. It's just, it, yeah. it, it gets ugly. How about someone trying to use the gift of discernment without love? It becomes mm -hmm. judgmental. Yeah. You know, finger pointing. Gossip. So, yeah, gossipy. Mm -hmm. It becomes arrogance. And so I think the Apostle Paul is telling us, if you want to, you know, if you want these spiritual gifts to operate correctly in your life, they need to be tempered with love mm -hmm. or they get out of control. So I think it's safe to say that the fruit of the Spirit 
must precede the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, that's good. Yeah. So if you have mm -hmm. spiritual gifts without spiritual fruit, you're doing more damage in the kingdom than you are. You're not being fruitful and multiplying. Mm -hmm. But if the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, temperance, faithfulness, meekness, mm -hmm. kindness, if that's guiding your spiritual gifts... Well, now you've got the framework to do all of this oh, yeah. work for the Lord, and mm -hmm. it's going to multiply. We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass, at just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. Earlier in chapter 12 and going into chapter 14, Paul's dealing with this incorrect mindset that everybody has. And we see it today in the church where people are clamoring after powerful demonstrations. You know, they want signs and wonders and miracles and resurrection power. Yeah. But then you, you have to think, well, why am I being raised from the dead? Yeah. When everybody's been resurrected, we're not just going to be continually resurrected. When everybody's been healed, there's no longer going to be a need for healing, which is what he's about to say here. Once these powers have been done, that's it. So what's the end goal? It's not the miraculous, yeah. and it's not the gifts of the Spirit, but it's a lifestyle of love towards yeah. other people and having a correct mindset, the kind of mindset Jesus had when he came down and became a man. Yeah. Uh, and Paul here is talking about what is, what is it like when you walk in the power of God, but you don't actually, in the rest of your time, because you're not just healing people all day, but in the rest of your time, the way you talk to your family, or the way you treat your neighbors, or even your internal life, yeah. how you relate to yourself, not just to others. Are you walking in love? Are you walking in gentleness? Yeah. And that's his main point here. Yeah, I want to talk about that phrase you just used, because... That's a phrase the body of Christ needs to use more often, walking in love. Mm -hmm. Okay, we talk about walking in the light, but walking in love. How much of our life are we walking out in love? So let's talk about in a practical sense what that looks like. So I think that if I'm walking in love, I have grace in my speech. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the indicators that I'm walking in love is I actually have grace coming out of my speech and I have mercy in my heart. So if someone does not have grace in their speech, because the Bible says that you are the salt of the earth mm -hmm. and, the, the, and the light of the world. And so if I'm salt and light, and if you look at that passage in Colossians where it talks about you being the salt of the earth, it says, so that you may have grace in your speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's actually spelled out just like that. Yeah. So... Being the salt of the earth means I speak with grace on my tongues. Yeah. And so I think if we're going to win the world, we have to go back to what Jesus told the disciples. They will know mm -hmm. that you are my disciples and that you have loved one for another. For one another. Yeah. I mean, in Micah 6, 8, God talks to the, through the prophet to Israel and he says to them, you know, he commands them to do all these offerings, this elaborate system to uh, cover their sins. And then they start giving God these offerings. And then he comes to them time and time again and says, I'm not satisfied by your offerings. That's right. So you're like, what's the deal? Yeah. <laughs> but then in, in Micah, he says, your problem is not that you're giving offerings, but you give them out of an incorrect place, yeah, an incorrect right. motivation. And then he says, uh, he, uh, this is what I want from you. I want you to do things justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Yeah. So how many believers are doing things for the Lord, but they're not walking in humility, not walking yeah. in love, and God's not pleased with them? But why is God, you know? Okay, so I think we've just given a great explanation of what walking in love looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's grace, it's mercy, it's humility, it's 
attitudes toward other people around us, all of that is walking in love. So what is the opposite of that? Mm -hmm. So what does walking without love look like? Well, I think it looks like arrogance. It looks like self-centeredness, narcissism. Mm -hmm. It looks like um, bullying. Yeah. It looks like overbearing. It looks like quick temper. Yeah, quick temper, slow yeah. views. Yeah, and so if God is slow to wrath, mm -hmm. and that's his nature, why aren't we practicing slow to wrath? Why are mm -hmm. we quick to wrath instead of slow to wrath? So I think all of those ideas are what walking in love looks like. Well, let, let's go on down through, into this chapter a little bit more because we've basically covered you know, the first three verses. But then it says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant. It's not rude. Now, if we break every one of those down, man, you can do a whole series on, okay, or even if we break it down into a question, how patient are you? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I guess I should point at me and say, mm -hmm. how patient am I? Um, how kind am I? Uh, how, 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 you know, look at this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Mm -hmm. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Uh, love does not insist to have its own way. My goodness, how many people do we know that insist always on having it their own way? And they're totally unflexible, mm -hmm. totally, you know, they're, they're sensitive to the point that if it doesn't go their way, they get upset easily. Yeah. Their families have to walk on eggshells around them because they're, you know, they got such a short fuse. So um, how about this one? Love is not irritable. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that right there is eye-opening. Love mm. is not easily irritated and love is not resentful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW, 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37312. Thank you. God bless you and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. Verse 6, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Wow. And, and I love how the New King James, which is a, a version that I preach out of a lot, that says love keeps no records of wrongs. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to just stop here and weigh in there because if you truly forgive someone, you can't keep bringing it back up. Mm -hmm. You know, if you forgive someone in your heart and you keep bringing it back up, you really never forgave them. So true forgiveness means I keep no record of wrongs. You know, if God is not keeping a record of wrong, why are we? So true forgiveness mm -hmm. means that I am not keeping records wrong. Now, if you've ever had to forgive someone before and I, I say it that way because sometimes you don't want to forgive someone, mm -hmm. but you have to forgive them. Yeah, that's true. So sometimes your, your, your emotions want to see them get paid back mm -hmm. for what they did, especially if it's deep or betrayal or something like that. So if you've ever had to forgive someone, you know that you give up your rights to keep bringing it up. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things you have to give up. You almost have to say, I will not bring it up against you again. You almost mm -hmm. have to verbalize that contractually and say, I'll sign it if you want yeah. me to, but I will not bring it up again to prove that I've forgiven you. Mm -hmm. And in your heart, you can't keep doing that. And so keeping in mind that this lesson on love is there to show us what love looks like, what love does not look like, but more importantly, it's there to help us know what the gifts of the Spirit look like without love. So when you get down into, into verse 8, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for mm -hmm. tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. Okay, I think this is a good place to 
to look at cessationism. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because the cessationists are those who believe that the <laughs> gifts of the Spirit have, have ceased with the apostles. And this is their anchor verse right here. Mm -hmm. um, but love never ends, but prophecies, they will come to an end or they will cease and tongues they will cease and knowledge will come to an end. So here's my question to every cessationist. If you believe that tongues have ceased, and if you believe that prophecies have ceased, you also believe that knowledge has ceased. Because mm -hmm. you can't have one without the other. You can't say tongues have ceased and prophecies have ceased and not say knowledge have ceased because that's part of it. Well, no, the Bible says in the last days, knowledge will be increased. And we're mm -hmm. living in that. I mean, technology overturns every single day. Yeah. So he's not talking about never hearing another prophecy or never hearing another tongue. He's saying that when you walk away from your spiritual gift, I'm operating in a, in a, in a tongue and now I'm not. Mm -hmm. I was operating in a prophecy. I was operating in the gift of knowledge. He's still talking about spiritual gifts. And now suddenly the service is over and I'm going home. Am I still operating in love? Mm -hmm. So he's saying that you, you can't just live for those big altar moments where you're Absolutely. praying for people and you're this high powered evangelist and not live your life in a way that it has to be consistent. So, so here's a good question. We've probably all seen people before in our life that in the pulpit and in the altar, they look like a powerful man or woman of God, but then you see them outside of that and they're a jerk. Mm -hmm. What does that say to, to people about their spiritual yeah. gifts? Jesus, he even talks about in the Gospels, he talks about at the end days when he's judging those that claim to follow him, people are going to come before him and talk about these powerful works. You know, we prophesied, we yeah. cast out demons, we did all these things. And then he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Yeah. And so it's one of the scariest verses in the Bible for a minister yeah. because you come to find out that you can actually do things for God and be far away from him at the same time. And Paul here points out what's going on. He says, if, if you're not walking in love, you know, and he describes what love is. I think one of the favorite things is uh, it doesn't rejoice at what's wrong, but it rejoices in what's right. Yeah. You know, in other words, you're not thinking about your own what's good for you, but what's good for others. Here's a fine line there. We try to impress God by doing what we know God likes mm -hmm. instead of doing what God asks. Wow. Yeah. So... What God likes may not be the same thing that He asked me mm. to do. So being in the will of God means I'm doing, I'm obedient. I'm doing what God asked me to, not just trying to press God by, oh, I know God likes it when you do this. So sometimes we're trying to do the work of God instead of letting God work through us. Mm. And sometimes God doesn't want us to try to do His work. He wants to do His work through us as yielded mm -hmm. vessels. And I think all of these are the things the Apostle Paul is talking, talking about. I'm going to go down to, um, down to verse 10, um, actually verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put childish things behind me. Now he's talking about being older, an old sure. man here. He goes from a child to an old man. For now I see through a mirror dimly. Mm-hmm. So he's not saying that spiritually he's dim. He's saying he's older. His eyes, I mean, you see me keep lifting up these glasses. It's because that my eyes are getting dimmer as, uh, you know, I'm in my 50s, but that, it, that's when it starts happening. So I have to put on these glasses. I see through a mirror dimly, but then I'll see face to face. I only know in part, but then I'll be fully known mm. as I am known. And then he ends this with this anchor verse but now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Mm -hmm. So you want to you wanna say anything about faith, hope, and love, or this verse about being a child and putting away childish mm -hmm. notions? Well, I could say two things. One's like technical, the other one's spiritual. But the first thing is there's this uh, interesting thing that psychologists call the, the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, I believe. And it's where if you actually don't know a whole lot about a subject but you begin to know something about it, you think you know everything. Yeah, that's right. And then the more you know, that yeah. drops in the opposite direction, and you're like, I know nothing. Yeah. And slowly, as you become really learned about it, you build, you don't shoot right back up, you slowly build your confidence. And, and But the crazy thing is, the confidence you have now, 
when you increase in that knowledge is usually built up by you helping others. Yeah. The, the immature confidence Exercising the gift. is just, oh, well, I know everything now. You can't tell me anything. But later, usually it's practitioners, people out in the field that are helping others yeah. that gain confidence, not because they think they know everything, but because they've come to find out they can be helpful to others yeah. with the knowledge exactly they have. Exactly right. And so Paul here, he's That's saying good. children, they think, you know, oh, just like the Corinthians, we got it. We figured it out. He's like, no, 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 no. Here's something you can measure. That is a great way to explain that verse, what mm -hmm. you just did. You know, as a child, I thought I knew everything. Mm -hmm. And then I realized as an adult, I didn't know nearly as much. I thought I saw everything. Now I realized as an adult, I was seeing only half of it. Mm -hmm. I only knew in part and I only understood in part. That's a great way because I think that, okay, so when it comes to spiritual gifts, putting this in that setting back into that context again, when someone starts operating a spiritual gift, they think they're all powerful. Mm. And wow. you have to grow into a gift. And you're going to mess up a gift sometimes. When you're working in spiritual gifts, you're going to miss it sometimes and get in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But that's the child part. Mm -hmm. Just keep growing and you'll get it right. Yeah, you might mess up your first prophecy or mess up yeah. your first prayer for the sick or mess up your first walk of faith and feel like you just fumbled it. That's okay. You're a child. You see in part... Keep growing until you get it right. But at the end of the day, if your motive was, look at me, you're wrong. But mm -hmm. if your motive was, I love God and his people and I'm trying to help somebody, then God says you're okay. Amen. Because it's anchored in love. Yeah. And uh, faith, hope, and love, those things abiding. I think that's Paul's simple way of saying, you know, before you, he was talking to the Corinthians, before all of you began to have these experiences spiritually, when you first had the gospel preached to you, you experienced this new faith in Jesus and this hope in everything he's done for you. And it produced love in you, seeing yeah. the love he's had for you. That's good. You know? So uh, That's very good. Th that never changes. Yeah. No matter what stage you are in your, your time as a believer, you yeah. always have those things, and especially love. So my faith in Christ gave me hope, but my hope has to be anchored in mm -hmm. love and love has to remain all throughout my faith mm -hmm. walk and my hope walk. Well, this was great, man. I enjoyed yeah. doing this. We need to do this more often. We'll I think maybe it. we just need to take a book of the Bible one day and just sit and talk about it. Oh yeah. We do this, you know, we do this off camera, but you guys are getting to see, you know, mm -hmm. some of the things we do in the break room right now. But we thought this would be the best way to show you and explain to you how 1 Corinthians 13 works. So it's been such an honor teaching this course with, uh, with Matthew and uh, whom I call Theo, but it's been such an honor mm -hmm. uh, teaching this course with him. And I know that you're going to be blessed by it. And I hope that this gives you a great understanding of 1 Corinthians 13.